Uh, thank you uh, for the kind invitation to come here to Vancouver, one of my very favorite cities. Um, it didn't take a lot of arm twisting to convince me to come here. I'm always delighted to do it. I, um, I thought I would just say a, a little about me and my relationship to Vancouver. I, uh, I was mentioning a little earlier, I, I've seen Vancouver in these sort of five to eight year time lapse photos. I think my first trip here was in the 1970s. Um, when I was a graduate student uh, at, at UCLA, uh, I, my, my first foray into transportation and land use, I started looking at a lot of regional plans and I came across uh, the livable regions strategy. I think it was a 1977 plan or so forth. And, and to me that was really a thoughtful, illuminating, illustrative plan about how your region would grow, particularly investing in public transit as a backbone network. And I, I just found it to be a very forward-looking, uh, innovative plan at the time. Um, in 1986, I came to the World Expo, and, and the theme was on transportation and communications, future transportation. I think they actually rolled out the SkyTrain, and I, I believe I was among the very first people to ride it, the Expo line that they opened up at the time. So that was uh, pretty impressionable on, on me at the time. As uh, I recall, they were a lot of visions about Metro Town and Burnaby and New Westminster, these would be transit-oriented villages and so forth. So again, um, a very forward-looking place. Uh, I, I wrote a book a number of years ago now called The Trans Metropolis, but I recall about 10 years ago I was invited by Mike Hartcourt, your former premier and I guess mayor of Vancouver as well, and uh, he, wonderful gentleman, but he took me on this great walking tour of Granville Island and the Falls Creek area. I recall having looked at Falls Creek in the industrial era and what it kind of looked like now. But he gave me a lot of insights into the politics of how this came about. And my other recollection, he said, by the way, uh, we're going to stop by Chinatown. And he didn't tell me this, that there was actually a parade where he was the Grand Marshal and there were all these dragons uh, marching all around. So anyway, I, that, that was a fun time. Um, so, so again, I'm, I'm so delighted to be here. I uh, only wish we could bring some of your rain to California. We're so bone dry and arid. So it's, it's nice to see lushness and green. I've, uh, looked at uh, white hillsides long enough now. So, so anyway, um, you know, when Anthony asks me to talk, and you know, I kind of scratch my head that well, this is a university, so I should make this a bit academic. But um, I, I also felt I should make this somewhat applied, and hopefully something which resonates with with the practitioner community. So, what I thought I would do is really reflect on a body of work that I've been doing over the years, many folks have done, but kind of gets at this core question. I mean, it's almost a bit of a cliche, but kind of the D word, uh, density, uh, in mass transit and mass. Does mass transit need mass? You need concentration and density to have cost-effective systems. So uh, density, the D word, of course, sends shutters uh, down the minds of planners and politicians and community activist folks. I mean, it's something where there's a lot of conflicts about density and its role in the city. So in my presentation, I'm, I'm going to first start off uh, kind of a broader policy context of density and particularly address issues about density and resource consumption, what we know at different scales, but particularly focus on two topics, density and congestion and density somewhat livability and, and what I'm going to call articulated density, going away from this broad notion of having tall buildings all over the place to really organizing and managing and designing at will. Um, I'll then focus briefly about some work that we did, I did with a few students um, three or four years ago that got published, but it, it, it really gets at what I often am most asked by politicians who want to know, okay, we're going to build a bus rapid transit system, we're going to build a light rail system, you tell me in advance what are the minimum densities we should be zoning for to achieve some level of cost effectiveness of this very expensive investment. So uh, somewhat of getting at that. And then I'm going to kind of end on some recent work, a little more global of bus rapid transit and some of the, what we know about density and performance. So hopefully uh, there's some connections between this and if, um, We'll have certainly time for Q&A and, and uh, discussions. Okay, um, well, it, it's hard to talk about the topic of density in cities without this graph, and it's probably one of the most frequently reproduced graphs. And of course, my understanding is your lecture series, your previous speaker was Jeff Kenworthy, who no doubt had a version of this, but I think it does say a lot. I mean, it, uh, this, 
takes, uh, in this case, transport-related energy consumption across a handful of global cities, and then um, what we, uh, got to make sure I have this, okay. Uh, and on this axis, ur urban density. And it, it's sort of this standard uh, exponential decay function. So, of course, these are North American cities. These happen to be U.S. cities and European cities, and then some of the outliers like Hong Kong. And this work, it, it's very aggregate, uh, you know, Cities don't travel, people travel, and, and um, so when you summarize stuff at city level, it, it begins to get criticized from a scholarly research. And you know, a lot of people have noted, well, these cities are not only low density, but they also have high car ownership rates. You tend to have, these cities tend to be more fuel efficient, smaller vehicles. So there's a lot of other potential confounders that blur our ability to make um, inferences, but nonetheless, this is something that resonates. And I think this is a graph that probably has been more impactful of virtually any visual presentation summarizing uh, literature in this field. So let me just at least start off with that. Well, of course, that was energy consumption and density. And we all know what's uh, uh, consuming a lot of interest now is um, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change themes. And this is another widely cited statistic. This happens to be by uh, um, Elaine Bertrand of, of the World Bank. He's now with NYU University. But again, a very simple analysis that politicians and lay citizens can relate to. And, and this analysis took two cities, um, Atlanta and Barcelona, with very similar populations at roughly the year 2000. But we see in these two cities, even though Atlanta is a wealthier city on a parity purchasing power basis, the cities are not too different in terms of uh, per capita income, Atlanta's still higher, but both fairly advanced economies, um, high quality of life, certainly in Barcelona. But we see here with at the same population, with 125th the land area, Barcelona accommodates the same population. So needless to say, it's a much higher density, 25 times as high, and its um, CO2 emissions per hectare per year is roughly one-tenth of what Atlanta is. So clearly, something going on here between a much more compact, dense city like Barcelona and a fraction of the transport sector uh, greenhouse gas emissions of a place like Atlanta. And not to belabor this too much, but I just looked before at uh, energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions. Probably from a policy standpoint, what many folks are kind of using as an overall benchmark of sustainability is this uh, vehicle kilometers per capita, or BMT. I see I've intermixed them here. So, um, but uh, basically how many vehicle miles or kilometers are being logged per person. And this, again, is our good friend Jeff Kenworthy. And we see the same sort of negative exponential curve. So, you know, be it BKT, which, again, so correlates very highly with energy consumption, land consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, local ozone or um, photochemical smog emissions, uh, whether it be that energy consumption, uh, be it carbon dioxide emissions, we always see this kind of ex negative exponential curve. And indeed, when we break this down instead of city level data, as this is, uh, to traffic analysis zones or census tracts, and this ha happens to be uh, John Holtzclaw's work, uh, where he studied the same kind of pattern, in this case, between residential density and VMT per household, which again, associates highly with energy consumption, we see the same kind of plot. So, so again, almost regardless of what the vertical axis is, consumption, emissions, and almost regardless of what the scale is, city or census tract, you get the same negative exponential curve. And in certain ways, what it begins to tell us is the biggest payoff in density is going from extremely low densities to moderate densities. That's where you get the most precipitous decline. And after that, the rate of benefit tapers. So I, I think it's a very important lesson here. We're not talking about Hong Kong style densities. We really are, in many ways, trying to match the densities of uh, more European cities is where you get the hugest bang, the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak. Okay. Um, now, of course, the question always is, is a density vis-a-vis -vis all the other things that go with density, that accompany density? And many people would argue density in many ways is just a shorthand or surrogate for sustainable cities and sustainable mobility because the dense cities and neighborhoods typically are neighborhoods that often have mixed land uses. I mean, the most dense 
area, I'm sure, in Vancouver is here, but also probably the most mixed land use. You have housing, you have offices, you have retail, you have restaurants, you have a multiplicity of land uses. All of that sets the stage for shorter distance, more pedestrian trips. Uh, also, dense areas tend to, um, you know, it, it's, it's a generalization, but for the most part, they tend to average lower incomes and car ownership rates, but also uh, typically at the early stage of the life cycle, not at the high consumption mid-stage of life cycle, so you get smaller families and less car ownership and, and less consumerism. And then, of course, density. Uh, dense areas are rewarded with more frequent and better transit and often priced or parking. So is it these correlates of density that are driving down energy consumption, VMT, versus density itself? And uh, this is a study I did with Reed Ewing where we did a meta-analysis, and I, um, you know, I, I, I'm very mindful of not to make this too academic, but this was an effort to take the Ds of the built environment, density, diversity, uh, walkability as a design and what we call destination accessibility, how easy you can get to destinations you want to go to, and controlling for as many variables as possible, and these are based on some of the better studies, over 100 studies in North America, including Canada, so it was a meta-analysis, you can see that the influences of density itself on vehicle miles traveled, vehicle traveled, is pretty modest. Those are elasticities. So it's telling us, Controlling, you find two areas of comparable mixed use and walkability and, and location in the region in terms of access, and all the other control variables that went into these studies, like transit service quality, auto ownership levels, gas prices, as many control variables as you have, the marginal effects of density itself were quite modest, uh, pretty, pretty teeny. Um, now, this doesn't mean density is not important. And I think in certain ways it's a fetal exercise to sort of parse out um, density versus all these other factors. The, the reality is they're all codependent. Density by itself without the other elements is not, are not going to provide you very much. Uh, so, you know, that's, and these in many ways are interdependent factors. Again, typically density does involve all these other things. So, um, and again, I, I, my approach here is to draw in a, a, a several studies looking at this. This happens to be a study we did of Shanghai, came out in transport policy a few years back. My first trip to Shanghai was 1984. This is um, Nanjing Lu, the main thoroughfare, and, and basically it was just transit and walking and cycling. Very compact, fine grain urbanism, you know, not tall buildings, but richly mixed embroidered land uses. Um, good bike infrastructure, and, and uh, fairly good regional balance and sub-regional balance. A lot of activities were, were within walking and biking distance. We did a study of folks in Shanghai who moved from the center to some of these outlying areas. And this was um, kind of typically what you found. 13-story towers, denser housing. They were in much denser development for the most part. But isolated, way off in the periphery, single use, Super impenetrable super blocks. So higher density, but there was this corresponding much substantial increase in VMT, 275%. So clearly, isolated buildings in the middle of nowhere are not going to buy you travel reduction. So density requires all of these other things. That's obviously an important point. Um, an another important context of density is this sort of notion of congestion. And this is uh, a study came out by Wendell Cox. Many of you might know who he is. He's a libertarian, runs a think tank, and is very critical of, of a lot of sustainability planning principles. But, you know, he took the TomTom -tom data and uh, looked at the relationship across a lot of global cities of over a million inhabitants, and it's a positive line. You can see denser cities tend to have more congestion. So this excess travel time peak hour, that's the difference between uh, the percent difference between how much time on average it takes traveling in the peak period versus free, free flow off peak. So 30% more in the peak time. So a pretty strong positive relationship. And his inference from this is that, well, if we want to solve traffic congestion, let's have low density development. Let's just spread things out. Um, well, you know, basically, uh, th this is some data um, from the Bay Area that try to explain this relationship between density, 
and traffic densities, which is another way of saying congestion, uh, these happen to be three Bay Area communities that are upper middle income residential areas. Hillsburg is very suburban, exurban. It's in North uh, Sonoma County. Uh, Berkeley, of course, uh, this happens to be North Berkeley, which is an upper income area, and in central San Francisco is Russian Hill. So these are all well-to-do areas with high auto ownership rates. You know, typically um, one to two cars per household, perhaps lower in San Francisco than Hillsburg, but you can see the difference in density, person travel, and travel density. So if you go from Hillsburg uh, at five people per acre to San Francisco at 250 people per acre in Russian Hill, that's a 5,000% increase in density from five to 250. Correspondingly, Hillsburg averages 30 miles of travel and vehicle per person per day because it's low density and things are spread out. It's more single use. Um, whereas in central San Francisco, on average, people are logging four miles in vehicles per person per day because they're walking a lot more. They're taking public transport. So that's roughly an 87% decline. So what's happening, given the statistics, comparing the travel density? And that's simply multiplying the density, people per acre, times the VMT per person per day. If you multiply these two, you get the travel density, the vehicle miles traveled per acre per day, which is 150 in this lower density area, higher in Berkeley and considerably higher in San Francisco. So, so it actually goes up 667%. <laughs> so yes. Higher density drives down person travel, but in car-dependent societies, it doesn't drive down person travel as much as the densities rise, such that your net traffic densities, the num number of trip ins, origins and destinations per square kilometer or per acre, tend to be much higher in denser settings. And that's part of the territory of density in car-oriented settings. You're, in places where you have reasonably high car ownership rates, you're going to get these kind of patterns. So we, we know the story. Uh, so going back to Wendell Cox statistics, you can take virtually all great cities of the world, places that we all want to be, that we all associate as livable, desirable places, and they're stuck, they're traffic. They have very high traffic densities, and the excess time, the differential in travel times between peak periods and off-peak periods are very high. So clearly, um, congestion is part of the territory of density. Um, some people have made the analogy uh, on congestion. There's good congestion and bad congestion, just like cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So this is probably good congestion in the sense that it's a sign of a vibrant, healthy economy. Um, you know, places that have high unemployment or depressed economies would love to have traffic congestion. Nothing solves congestion more than people out of work and not making journeys to work. Um, but it's also a sign that you've um, refrained from overinvesting. You don't have these double stack turn lanes and multiple wide boulevards. And you know, Paris certainly has boulevards, but scaled more for pedestrians. But perhaps the most important thing, these are cities where also you have viable options to escape the congestion. You have respectable public transit choices. So there's ways of avoiding the congestion. So I think cities that have high livability high density and mixed use and all these things, but also congestion, do have these other alter attributes, and particularly good public transit. So I put Vancouver here, and I'm, I'm going to sort of stay on this theme on TomTom. -tom. Uh, Vancouver, by TomTom -tom statistics, uh, actually has the most congestion of any Canadian city. Um, so it ranks 35% of um, longer in the peak than the off-peak free flow conditions, much higher than Toronto, and on average 87 hours of delay per person per year for average 30-minute commutes. So does that make sense? Do most of you feel like you're wasting, or probably most of you don't drive cars, I, I'm assuming that. But um, Well, it's not only the most congested in um, Canada, but reputedly in North America as well. So this is also the TomTom -tom statistics, and this came from Wendell's Cox. So it, it's uh, by their 2013, the second quarter, you were more congested than Los Angeles, uh, which is not necessarily anyone's sort of uh, paragon of trying to match transport conditions. But okay, so you're, by all these statistics, it says you're congested. Uh, but what's going on? If you look at um, 
the economists, their livable cities, you're ranked number one as livability. So, you know, what, what's, what's the nexus between density, quality of life, perceptions of quality of life and density? You know, in many ways this begs us to kind of redefine. What I find, per, uh, what livability is, what I find particularly complexing is if you ask people what makes for the best quality of life, most common response is that not getting stuck in traffic congestion. People associate congestion with a very significant decline in quality of life. But, you know, so here we have a setting, your, your very city, uh, where you're repeatedly the most congested, but people seem to like it as a place to live. So anyway, this whole nexus of density, congestion, livability, I think, is an area we, we need to better understand. Um, my, my last sort of point on density uh, is um, this notion of articulated density. We, we as planners tend to have this notion of kind of blended density or area-wide density. It's kind of a, an amorphous idea, just kind of tall buildings all over the place. Um, this idea of articulated density, urban planning matters, well, um, you know, sort of the necklace of pearls model. A good example of that is Curitiba, Brazil. Curitiba actually, city of three and a half million inhabitants, well known for sustainable planning. It actually has among the lowest densities of Brazilian cities. It's no denser, say, than Brasilia. Um, but they have articulated densities and there's a good correspondence between high capacity, high quality public transit and where the densities are. Sao Paulo has higher densities. It's a much bigger metropolis but they're unorganized, unplanned, episodic, piecemeal stuff. And uh, you know, it, it gets rewarded, uh, Curitiba, much higher public transport use per capita, less congestion. So planning does matter, and how the densities are related to transit investments in particular matter. Now, the, the next three slides I'm going to purposely go through very quickly because I <coughs> don't want to bore you with a lot of uh, econometrics here. But I, I want to further talk about articulated density in the context of this study. If you're interested, it was an environment and planning A, where we took um, 370 US metro areas over fairly good longitudinal analysis. So these dots are the places we looked. And we actually drilled down to the square kilometer level to do things like job access. So it was a fairly robust um, statistically rich data, and we did one of these structural equation models, and I'm not going to trace through this, other than one of the key variables, this sort of metric of sustainability, v VMT, vehicle miles traveled per person. We were looking how population density and other factors fed into it, but if I just take this one little relationship here, um, our controlling for all the other things in the model, and again, if you're interested, you can go to the 2010 Environment and Planning A article, but all those other controls, the effects of population density over this roughly 15-year time period in 300-plus metro areas were quite strong in the U.S. Uh, all things being equal, doubling population density, you drive down VMT per capita uh, by 60%. But it's moderated by a lot of other indirect factors. Denser American cities tend to have higher road density positive relationship, and higher road density itself induces more travel, a more auto-oriented landscape. We had other metrics, I won't go through in that path model, that looked at access and design elements. And so basically, if you control for these other factors, density by itself, poorly designed or planned density don't, does not provide you very much in the way of environmental benefits or VMT per capita reduction. And we, in the paper, we called this the Los Angeles effects. Um, so Los Angeles is not articulated planned densities. It's what we actually call dysfunctional densities in the sense that it's the worst of all worlds. And I, I've lived in LA for a number of years. It's, it's a great town. I'm not here to beat up on LA, but as it relates to density in urban form and transportation, it has not been a success. Um, because you know th this really shows, excuse me, um, Kind of the tip, of, this is the San Fernando Valley, but it's how much of Los Angeles is designed. Probably many of you have heard, Los Angeles has among the highest population and household densities of any North American cities. It's got pretty high average densities throughout the metropolis, but a lot of it is two to three story walk up garden apartments that are horizontally scaled, spread throughout the metropolis. So in an auto-dependent society where you average 850 cars per 1,000 inhabitants, a lot of people have access to cars, with that design of density spread all over the map, it creates 
very high traffic densities. A lot of trip origins and destinations per square mile happening in this landscape, and that adds up to traffic congestion, notwithstanding a, a pretty significant um, freeway system. So it, it's dysfunctional in the sense that the densities are too high for a car-dependent landscape, too many trips per square mile, but they're not well organized for public transit. It's the worst of all rules. They're too high for cars, and they're not well designed for public transit. So um, there's a mismatch between the geography of travel spatially, which is many origins to many destinations scattered all over the map, and the geometry of a rail network, which is point to point. So they don't match. So that's a big part of why you don't have a very cost-effective transit network and the lack of articulated design densities have led to very high traffic congestion. So this idea of dysfunctional density. So, you know, Curitiba is an example of articulated functional densities. I would say the same thing in Stockholm, where kind of the necklace of pearls, um, you find the, the lungs of the community, the green space, very well-defined edges. This happens to be Shista out here, uh, served by rail. Now, you know, architecturally and other design perspectives notwithstanding, it's, it's considered to be um, very sustainable, well-designed. Stockholm is the only city I'm aware of, along with Copenhagen perhaps, that is really committed to and seems to be poised to be a zero-carbon city. This, uh, you know, compares CO2 emissions and industry buildings, transport, and you can see it in green, this spiderweb graph. It consistently ranks lower than these other global cities, London, uh, New York City, Rome, and Tokyo, and it's, it's in good part because the good correspondence between urban form and land use, but I would say specifically articulated densities, organized densities, well-planned densities. So, you know, that, uh, Stockholm is where in many ways um, the model of transit-oriented development where not only do you have a hub at the transit station and a community space where you get out of the train station and it's Chameleon-like, it changes. One day it's a farmer's market, the next day it's a public celebration, it's a public demonstration. So it becomes the hub, the centerpiece of the community. But it is, by the way, also where people chain trips. They get out of trains and pick up a loaf of bread or the kid at the child care center. So it really becomes an, an intermodal hub between walking and transit usage. So that's the kind of greenfield model of TOD. I just wanted to uh, note that places like Stockholm have now shifted from TOD on greenfields, master plan new towns and greenfields, to TOD on brownfields. And perhaps the best example of that is Hammer B. Shostead, um, which is right in the center, uh, right off the um, core of Stockholm. And it's, uh, it's a zero waste um, energy self sufficient development. They have uh, biofuel production, they take all um, organic waste and can create create biofuels, inorganic waste gets converted to uh, other fuel supply. So a very sustainable development, but they've done a lot of the other things uh, to make this work. Congestion pricing on the edge, good uh, light rail investments, traffic calming, community gardens, <coughs> so um, with, with site remediation. Um, so just as, as a bit of a sidebar um, on, before I move to the question of density thresholds and transit performance, uh, so, so, you know, density is important, uh, certainly to, to have um, low energy consumption, low carbon emissions, but they've got to be organized, they, they have to be planned, they have to be articulated. What are the tools we have to do that? Well, clearly zoning. Um, we can uh, regulate land use, but some of the better places that you find higher density around transit quarters, and this happens to be New York City where the dots represent uh, the... the, the MTR stations, the, the heavy rail stations, and the darker zones represent the floor area ratio. So we're talking in these dark areas here, uh, 10 to 12 to 15 uh, FAR, so the floor area divided by the land area. But when you have that kind of denser zoning along with a rectilinear small grain grid like you have, a very human scale uh, pattern of urbanism, you do begin to create these very pedestrian oriented places. Now, in the way, case of New York, you know, it obviously stacked up the higher densities on these transit corridors, and municipal coffers were enriched because property values are higher and it creates more property tax revenue. But of course, they, and I know a lot of Canadian cities have done this well, have actively used transfer development rights. 
uh, to, for, it's partly for historical preservation heritage building where you can sell off your development rights to someone in this highly accessible location at a transit station and they can in turn stack up the densities. Now, this has not only been done to create transit supportive densities on transit corridors, but also uh, you get bonuses for affordable or mixed income housing development, so it's helped achieve some of the housing improvements, but importantly, it's generated revenue to do all the embellishments and betterment of, of the public realm, of basically the armature of the neighborhood. So we're all familiar with New York City, uh, some of the transformations that have happened there, and some of, a, a lot of this revenue were through city coffers that were generated from these kinds of schemes of selling off development rights and transfer development rights. Uh, and you, know, you go to places like Broadway here, and it's gone through these kinds of transformations. So, Placemaking has been a critically important part of this, and you have to have revenues to build the bike infrastructure, to do the pedestrian plazas, to do all the armature enhancements that were necessary. So, you know, one of the things we certainly know is density by design. Uh, you make densities much more tolerable and acceptable to middle class choice consumers if you give good public spaces and good pedestrian designs in response. Of course, the money also went to upgrade uh, the subway system to rehabilitate and upgrade. But it takes money to do those things. And these schemes that allowed higher densities were really enabling factors to allow those kind of improvements. OK. Uh, I, I see I'm going to have to start moving on here because of time. So let me kind of shift gears. So you know, kind of a broader set of policy issues I wanted to set at the outset. Uh, let me get to this topic now of density and cost effective transit. And this is another area where you have very conflicted commentary. It's very ideological. So uh, probably some of you are familiar with the Cascade Institute. This happens to be um, an article by Randall Latoul, The Case Against Rail Transit. So he proceeds to very systematically explain why rail transit is, is a pork barrel, just wasting American taxpayers' money. Uh, so very much. Um, uh, writing against rail transit. And uh, your own Todd Littman at, at the Victoria Transport Policy Institute uh, comes up at the same time roughly saying, raise my taxes, please, how good transit can really make uh, households save money, conserve money, cr create more affordable housing. So two very different stories about rail investments and what it should, we should be doing in terms of informing public policy. So again, I ideologically somewhat splintered debates here. Um, there, there's another debate in, in the, um, very much in the academic literature about whether density is that important to make transit work. So if you read some of the work of Paul Meese, for instance, he sadly passed away a few years ago. He was at um, Muni um, Melbourne. Uh, but he wrote a number of books where he was arguing, we've put way too much focus on density. What matters? is clean, convenient, interconnected, high-quality transit. That's what we have to focus on, delivering much better transit, service quality. And let the markets more or less shape density. Yes, we might concentrate some growth, but it's really the T in transit-oriented development, transit, quality, and service that matters more. And I've got a colleague at Berkeley, Dan Chapman, that did a Journal of American Planning Association article a, a couple of years ago um, where basically the same argument, the T of TOD matters the most. Let's get the transit in order before we focus excessively on good European-style walkable communities around transit corridors. So, so yes, it, it, there's, there's all kinds of splintered debates that in certain ways make it very hard to inform practice and policy in this field. Well, as I mentioned before, probably the number one question I receive as someone who's thought about these questions and done a fair amount of research over the years, when I meet politicians in Charlotte, North Carolina, Orlando, Florida, um, San Diego, California, is always this question. Well, we're absolutely convinced we need light rail transit or we need bus rapid transit. We want to do it. You tell me what I need to do in my advanced planning to zone neighborhoods, employment, population density, so that 10 years later, these are cost-effective investments, so that they're going to pay off. That's without question, I think, what politicians, at least in my field, probably care most about. Many of them, are, we're, we're talking about huge public investments, money that could go to public schools or health care or so many other competing uses for scarce public resources. So if we're going to invest in these systems, let's make sure they're very effective, cost-effective investments.
Well, um, in truth, we don't have a lot of knowledge in this arena. Uh, if you work in this field of transit and land use, you might be familiar with the work of Boris Pusgrev and Jeff Zupan from 1977. Uh, they were uh, hired by the Regional Plan Association in, in New York City to more or less begin to set thresholds of some of the minimum densities and sizes of downtown you need to have cost-effective investments in light rail, rapid transit or heavy rail, commuter rail, and even local bus. And these are kind of the benchmarks in a residential dwelling units per residential acre that came out of that work. So fairly well cited. So if we take, for instance, uh, this here light rail transit, <coughs> they say um, to have a cost-effective light rail investment, uh, you need 250 million square feet of commercial office um, non-residential floor space in your downtown, and you need over roughly a 100 square mile service jurisdiction of the light rail system to average densities of nine dwelling units per residential acre. Um, so um, these are just images that probably begin to suggest the kind of densities they're talking about. These happen to be 12 units per residential acre, which are basically duplexes on kind of 4,000 square foot lots, a lot of shared wall construction, some triplexes. But if you have a thick enough alignment of these, you start of row houses, so to speak, you start hitting those densities. Townhomes with podium parking, and um, these begin to get more into this level. And then high, you know, three to four stories, strict construction. Usually, you don't, you, you don't go higher than three or four stories to economize. You don't have to build elevators. Uh, that's the kind of density. Um, when I show this statistic, I always am mindful that much of the world doesn't use acres, so I went ahead and converted this. So um, if you live in the world of hectares, roughly one hectare is 2.5. So those are the thresholds, would, uh, what you would need for hectares. Um, well, you know, where did this number come from, and, and, and why, why um, I asked myself, do, uh, the study we did about seven or eight years ago found about 15 to 20 U.S transit agencies and properties were using these statistics to guide their zoning around transit corridors. And this is a study. I mean, it was largely drawn from 1963 in a quite a different era. Um, and looking at the relationship between home base weekday trips per person and density, residential density. So if you look at what transit is yellow and green, these colors here, that's bus and subway and rail. So it's, it's the bottom three realms. Basically, the nine units per acre is, is where you get a big jump in threshold between um, very low uh, transit trip mode sp splits at nine, and they, this was kind of the inflection point where you got the big noticeable jump. So it's kind of almost as if somewhat arbitrarily or subjectively they drew the line here to say these are kind of the minimum thresholds we should be guiding these investments based on 1993. 1963 data in a metropolitan area which is not necessarily that representative of many parts of the U.S. So, you know, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars of investments somewhat hinging on these kinds of assumptions of densities. Well, we got a grant uh, to um, somewhat update this analysis, and I'll sort of briefly share uh, the results of this study with you, and I'm mindful of time here. Uh, we, we looked at 59 U.S. transit projects. This happens to be Sacramento, and uh, over a nine-year panel. And of course, the wonderment of GIS, you can draw all these one-half-mile circles and get all kind of good land use data, including density. Uh, and if you're interested, it's in a couple of articles here, including Journal of American Planning Association, his work. So again, uh, the half-a-mile ring around stations. Um, just briefly, we, we, we sort of compared straight line distances from the edge to the station. This happens to be BART versus network distances. And we also had adjusted service areas to account for parking lots you could walk through. And the short of it is almost any metric we used of connectivity and walking time to the station or even the size of the catchments. We used one and a half mile catchments, one mile catchments, one half mile, one quarter mile. Virtually no difference in relationships. We always found very similar relationships between density and ridership performance. Um, so what did we do here in this analysis? Well, we, we basically ran ridership models as a function of density, cost models as a function of density, many other factors in operating, uh, capital costs and operating cost models to come up with a net cost per ride passenger mile. 
as a metric to begin to study um, per, um, cost, of, um, cost effectiveness of these different investments. So uh, the direct ridership model, will, those of you who work in transportation planning will know that you know, we're always taught to run these utilitarian disaggregate models. Well, uh, direct ridership models don't study individual behavior. They're studying relationships between neighborhood attributes of stations and performance. And I think they're relevant for this kind of analysis because we, we aren't studying individual choice and behavior. We're really trying to see neighborhood densities. What are the relationship between those and, and performance? So it's, in my judgment, the right spatial unit. So anyway, ridership is a function of jobs in the half a mile zone. That's job density, um, population density, controlling for a whole set of service variables, including service frequency, location variables, dummy uh, fixed effect variables and error terms. So it's basically a standard ridership model. Uh, these happen to be 21 US cities for which we had good GIS data to fit into that model, and plus we had the 1,400 plus stations. So fairly but robust data. So, so basically, um, running these models, these are the elasticities, controlling for all these other variables. So I'm not listing all the other variables, but you can see over this time period in those US settings, yes, there was a fairly significant relationship between job density and population density. These are elasticities. All things being equal, controlling for fares, service frequency, all these other variables. If you double job density within a half a mile, you get a 60% boost in passenger miles traveled. So a pretty robust relationship. Uh, the population density was, was lower um, but the, so the point I want to make here is that there was higher sensitivity of where you put jobs than population in terms of ridership performance. But you can also see service variables were important. The, quality, the frequency of service, controlling for density and other factors, also gives you a boon in ridership. Uh, these were two stage least square models because it acknowledged that there's endogeneity here, that ridership in, is influenced by service and frequency. But service and frequency is also influenced by ridership, so you have to control that statistically. But it's not just ridership that goes up with density, but so do cost. You know, in denser settings, right away costs more, dislocation effects, utilities are um, you know, changing, uh, upgrading, uh, plumbing of, of the city. All of those factors drive up costs. So we did cost models of the 59 systems uh, you know, these are total costs of the projects. So these, these represent scale economies. The more route miles you reduce uh, cost. But job population densities were associated with higher costs. In fact, this told us all things being equal, um, if you in every additional job per acre was associated with the $2 million increase in the construction cost of the project. So yes, population, job density mattered. Uh, alignment, if it was subway, that was a dummy variable. That obviously drove up cost, but also wage levels. Denser places tend to have more powerful labor unions. They tend to be in bigger cities that result in higher wage rates, and all of that got reflected in the models. So they were decent analyses. Uh, we also did operating cost models. So we looked at the, you know, the fact that operating costs increase with vehicle miles and vehicle hours of service. That's kind of a standard operating cost. But we also had... Um, factors like median wage rates, uh, which drive up labor cost, and the fact that particularly light rail systems and shared right-of-way configurations have a lot more stop-and-go maintenance expenses and so forth. So the operating cost models picked up the effects of density as well. So basically what we did in this analysis is density went in all the models, the ridership model, the capital cost model, the operating cost model. So we came up with the net cost per passenger mile so that was taking the amortized annualized capital costs per, plus the annual operating costs for each of these 59 systems divided by per year the passenger miles traveled. So we came up with the cost per passenger mile. We took the total passengers per year times the average fare um, <laughs> divided by the passenger miles. So taking the difference, we have a net cost per passenger mile. So it really was a way to take you know, as not indirect costs, but direct capital operating costs and revenues, and this is a frequency distribution. So we can see these systems, these were the highest performing investments of the 59 projects we looked at, uh, actually 54 that we had complete data, and this happens to be projects going back to 1970. 
uh, these were the highest performing projects in the sense that the net cost per passenger miles were less than 50 cents US dollars. These were the losers, the dogs, if you will. Um, Santa Clara County Light Rail, that was coming up of net cost per, per person per mile on an annual basis of $4. I mean, that, that begins to be the cost taking the average trip in Santa Clara County to the Silicon Valley, you could pay these people to ride taxis and it would be cheaper. So, so this was an extremely expensive investment. So huge variations in costs that we found from this analysis. Because density were, was in all of these models, the ridership model, the capital cost model, the operating cost model, we were able to plot the relationship of density and this net cost per passenger mile. And we were able to stratify by light rail and, and heavy rail. So uh, this more or less just shows what the break-even point is, that this happens to be jobs and population per gross area, uh, 28 persons and um, people per gross area was where uh, heavy rail actually became cheaper than light rail. So basically what's happening is light rail up to about 30 units per acre, uh, 30 units and, and jobs, or 30 people and jobs per acre, uh, light rail is cheaper because its capital costs are, uh, as a function of density, are much lower. But when you start getting higher density, you generate so much, many more riders and re fare box revenue that heavy rail starts becoming a more cost-effective investment than light rail. So, Now, one of the things I, I, I meant to sort of caution here, you've got to be extremely careful in these kind of statistics depending on what the denominator is. So if you recollect the, the work from Zupan and, and Pushkarev, they had residential density. Our GI, GIS data only allowed us to measure gross density. So residential density is, is the land area devoted to residential use. Gross density is all land area, including non-residential. Then you'll find data on net residential density. That'll take residentially zoned land and net out parking, streets, public parks, lakes, hillsides. So, you get gro widely differing numbers depending on what the denominator is. So uh, you've got to be very careful of, of kind of interpreting these benchmarks. Um, but in our case, the data allowed this metric to, to do this very plot. Um, we also looked at density thresholds based on these projects that would put you in the top quartile of cost effectiveness. So um, now we had to control for a lot of variables. So for large heavy rail cities with that size of, of downtown, controlling for service frequency, all the other variables in the model. So a lot of, of average statistics and median statistics had to go in to make these projections. These are the people per gross acre, that's what this is in, uh, that puts you in the top quartile of cost effectiveness performance in terms of cost per passenger mile being the lowest. Uh, and this, by the way, was set based on it equates with the marginal cost of lowering fares to achieve a very comparable level of passenger miles increase. So that's kind of why we set the, the top quartile thresholds. So if, if you take the US transit projects for heavy rail, uh, the average capital cost was 231 million, very expensive. So what that is telling you is that um, you would be needing uh, 50 people per gross acre, which on a residential acre, if we assume half the land is residential on average of a city would be 100 people per residential area. If it was 30% of land was residential, then it would be more like 130%. So again, the denominator matters a lot here. The average light rail system costs 45 million. Um, that would require 32 people per gross acre on a you know, net residential acre. It might be well over 100. So, so um, at least we begin to get some benchmarks here. Um, this just simply tells us uh, how the curves plotted out by these different modes, um, heavy rail, light rail, and bus rapid transit. So if a capital cost was $50 million per mile of the running way or guideway, um, these would be the densities for these different kind of modes to be in the top quartile of performance. So anyway, this study has a lot of this data. Um, one of the things I did want to note, many systems don't uh, meet these thresholds. So for instance, um, Atlanta, Buffalo, um, this threshold here, Atlanta, Buffalo, Miami, some eight different heavy rail systems 
Their job and population per gross acre don't reach this benchmark, so our analysis suggested they would have been more cost-effective investments if they would have been light rail instead of heavy rail. Um, so, you know, the, the dilemma with this analysis is that those nomographs, which um, politicians and planners like, they're based on a lot of assumptions. You have to control all of those other, other variables, um, fix them. So we, we did a follow-up study, a TCRP study. I did this with Dan Chapman. Um, and just to let you know, we expanded the analysis to many more metro areas and transit stations. We also did, instead of project-level data, we did metropolitan-level data to look at network effects. And, and what that means is you can make a light rail or heavy rail improvement, but you're not going to only affect cost-effectiveness on those corridors, but also the entire network which integrates to them. So, we accounted for network effects. And I simply wanted to show you can go to the website here, and we have kind of a, just a simple spreadsheet tool. It's kind of a first cut um, analysis where instead of using those nomographs, I said, where you have to assume these kind of fixed inputs, you can input data for your own corridors and get sort of a first cut analysis. So this is the ridership model. This is the capital and operating cost model. And this produces some of the estimates of um, of uh, cost effectiveness. And of course, this is based on US experiences, but at least uh, it's, it's some effort to begin to provide some capacity to identify densities, which are identified in here, that you need to achieve cost effectiveness tailored to the specific situation of your corridor. OK, um, so um, moving along, I'm going to wrap this up in five or 10 minutes here. Uh, let me just kind of close on a, a more global perspective bus rapid transit. This happens to be an area I've been working in. I spent the last uh, year, about three months, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, uh, helping them with a bus rapid transit system and the design and some of the land use planning with it. But I think we all recognize that BRT systems, they, these are really the most rapidly growing uh, investments we're seeing in public transit. This happens to be uh, 2013, we had 168 cities. I think it's well over 190 by now. And you can see a lot of these systems are in Latin America, but many parts of uh, places in the global south, um, largely because it's more affordable. Um, so bus rapid transit, of course, we're talking about dedicated running ways that's high in bus rapid transit. And this just compares very briefly light rail and metro. Uh, but here's the big factors, is that you can begin to achieve with um, double carriageways, two um, lanes per direction, passenger throughputs in terms of people per direction per hour, which begin to match the throughputs of much more pricey metro rail systems, but, but at a fraction of the cost. So you can see comparisons here in 2,000 US dollars that the BRT systems, and these are averages, tremendous variation, but coming in at not even one-tenth of the metro rail systems, but beginning to match some of the throughputs. Part of the logic of BRT is that um, a lot of bus lanes tend to be on the curb, but the curbs are the messiest places you can put buses. That's where you have taxi stopping, traffic coming out of driveways, delivery trucks, passenger pickup. So they're just messy lanes. And buses have slow acceleration, deceleration. They get gummed up faster in traffic congestion in the curb lane than anywhere else. If you put them in the median lane and have good armature and good connectivity, uh, in decent pedestrian access, you can really achieve much higher um, uh, performance. And of course, if you have a dedicated running way, an exclusive guideway, even more so. Um, as it relates to land use, though, in many parts of the world that are building bus rapid transit, these are the perceptions we have of buses in neighborhoods. You know, it's uh, street hawkers and in informal sectors. It's just kind of chaos. Most transit stations and bus hubs, if, and particularly in Africa, look like that. Just broadly also, there's a perception this is a second class form of mobility. Rubber tire vehicles don't have the regional connectivity and access, so you're not going to shape land use. Uh, the non-permanence of investment, um, we often hear of that, why there's not as much interest of densifying investing on BRT corridors. Of course, when you have a dedicated um, running way or, or guideway, that it's a bit different. But you know, even sort of the stereotypes of diesel fumes emitting out of the tailpipes of buses, it's all of these negative stereotypes and stigmatizes bus transit and any interest in sort of advancing um, transit-oriented development in higher densities. Um, 
Well, we did an article on BRT-TOD, it was called, in Transport Policy, that came out last year. And uh, looking at some of these relationships between density and ridership per kilometer, and you can see decent elasticities, um, often, you know, controlling for BRT kilometers. If you double the population density, you get roughly a 40% increase in ridership per, um, per, per in ridership. So um, that happens to be Curitiba. And, you know, one of the things you often want to do when you do simple plots like this is zero in on the outliers. Something's different going on here. Uh, and we all know the Curitiba story, um, it's articulated densities. I mean, it's good visionary planning, not in the last five years. They've been working hard at this for a good 40 years. Uh, but more or less, they have these linear corridors uh, where the densities taper wedding cake style with distance. They put the higher densities, but they also allow sunlight to shine through to create better pedestrian corridors by some setbacks. Um, it's also the fact that they have good service. It's not just density. If you're in Curitiba, the frequent stop um, by articulated buses, 270 passengers per vehicle, but it stops very frequently is here. The limited stop, smaller vehicles run parallel one way. So they layer in so much serv differentiated service, you get very high service quality. So it's not just density, it's service frequency and quality that's driving it. Uh, but it's also mixed land use. Because they intermix land uses up and down these corridors where stops are not only where people live, but where they work and where they shop and where they go to restaurants or where they study, live, work, learn, play uh, environments up and down these corridors, so that in the peak hour, um, when you have this kind of mixed use, um, you know, one person might be making that trip, going from home to work, um, Another person at the same time might be going from this home site to this job site. So if you, the great thing of intermixing land uses on linear corridors, natural transit corridors, is balanced mixed use development leads to balance flows. You get very efficient utilization of the expensive transportation infrastructure. And places like Curitiba, they have 55, 45% directional splits. In the peak hour, 45% of people are going in one direction. 55% in the other direction. So, you know, versus imbalanced land uses where the jobs are here, the housing and university and other things are over there, uh, you get unidirectional flows. So it's not just density, it's mixed use, all these other factors we've been talking about. Um, Curitiba, by the way, as I said, is not a dense city. Its density is actually, this is Alan Batura's work, um, no higher than Brasilia. Um, but it's... Even it's got articulated density, but it's importantly, it's got balanced mixed land uses. So, so this takes the build up areas of Brasilia and Curitiba, 275, uh, 275 square kilometers. But because you have segregation of where people live, work, study, and play in Brasilia versus the intermixing of land uses in Curitiba, on average, the Curitibano uh, resides three times closer to the center city. So again, articulated densities but the balancing, mixing of uses all come together to create a sustainable city. So we know the story of, Cur of Brasilia, you know, a master plan, new town, uh, carved out of the jungles of central Brazil, designed uh, the aeroplane plan, uh, but, but it's not only spread out in auto-oriented, but they segregated land uses. So you have a um, sector for commercial de uh, development, you have a sector for cultural development, they're all in different quadrants of the city, you have a sector for residences, all interlaced by generous roadway capacity. So, you know, you take the cityscape, the density patterns, which are very similar in Brasilia, but a segregated, isolated, inaccessible metropolis versus Curitiba, uh, you can see the differences in outcomes. Um, you know, much higher transit utilization, uh, and lower VKT. And, and actually, Curitiba, even though it's an industrial city, you have a lot of, like, uh, Volvo has their bus manufacturing plant in Curitiba. Brasilia, as the national capital, is a service government industry city. The air quality is cleaner in, in Curitiba, in good part because of the urban design. Well, um, of course, a lot of Latin American cities have tried to follow Curitiba's footsteps. Um, these are among the few. Uh, Bogota gets a lot of the credit of having a very high-end uh, BRT, dual carriageway. It's sort of the gold standard according to ITDB, the International Transport Development Program. 
very high passenger ridership levels, the highest worldwide. Um, and again, it's this dual carriageway. But from a land use standpoint, it's the polar opposite of, of Curitiba. It was not designed to transform the metropolis. In fact, they chose, it was an engineering project. It wasn't a planning project. It was the path of least resistance, the corridors with the least disruption, the cheapest capital cost and right of way. These often happened to be very stagnant, depressed districts, so there were no way to leverage uh, development. Abysmal walking environments, you know, pedestrian connectivity was an afterthought, so overcrowded. So it's, it's just not a very attractive um, project in terms of shaping the metropolis. Uh, we did this book uh, in the World Bank I co-authored with uh, Hiro Suzuki and uh, Kiro Uchi, um, where we, we took uh, data basically on land coverage and did match pair comparisons. So this happens to be intermediate transmillennial stations within a walking distance matched to areas similar income, similar subregional location, uh, but not within this walking distance. And we actually found more land development happening away uh, from the BRT than near the BRT. In fact, you know, people stigmatize the BRT. It's where you had informal food hawkers. It's where you had overcrowded sidewalks, motorcycle taxis. It was just an absolutely unattractive place for land transformation. In fact, uh, our analysis showed that the highest density growth in the 2000s, the first 10 years of Transmillennial were on the periphery off of the red line, the Transmillennial. These are actually feeder buses, free feeder buses that are going into the lower density, um, or, or going into the peripheral areas. Now, some of these are informal settlements, but clearly pretty modest land use intensification happening uh, along the, the corridor itself. Um, in this book, we tell a very similar story in um, Omnibod, they're, they're considered to have the best BRT system in India, the Janmarg system. Now, um, they've, they used to be a huge textile manufacturing city, and a lot of that has moved to cheaper Indian cities. So they have like 20 huge textile sites off of the, the BRT network. So tremendous opportunities to do uh, land consolidation and readjustment. They have a very long tradition of town planning review. So a lot of tools to do some very innovative things. The problem is the politicians there, their perception is that, one, the best way to decongest the overcrowding of the city is to cap density. So the densities are basically unarticulated. They don't, zoning doesn't differ anywhere. In fact, the highest densities are in the edge city and dust uh, office corridor off of a motorway to the west of the city. And then lastly, uh, they're very concerned about um, enriching people by uh, property owners giving them higher permissible densities. And, increasing their property values. So it's such a sort of class conscientious setting that they seem politically incapable of, of increasing the densities and doing the, the stationary planning to create a, a good environment. So if you're interested in these cases, uh, you can see, find this book. The PDF is for free online. So, so um, and, and by the way, I just wanted to mention on the bot, it's just the same story. It's never just a density. It's also design. So, you find these stations uh, with basically no pedestrian access. You've got to walk through the motorcycle, taxi drivers, and dodge the three-wheelers to try to navigate yourself here. So it's, it's not, a, from a design standpoint, a very attractive system. So, so I'm going to close um, just by a couple of observations. Um, you know, I, I think this body of work, clearly, uh, density does matter. It's necessary, but it's obviously not sufficient. If density without mixed land uses, good design, sub-regional balance, good quality public transit is not going to deliver any of these kind of benefits. So it's sufficient, it's necessary but not sufficient. It's, in many ways, again, density is simply a surrogate or proxy for smart growth. Uh, it's a proxy for good transit, sustainable cities, sustainable transportation, good location, good transit. You know, Europeans, they use the term compact city for smart growth, but it's, so, you know, when we say density, unfortunately, in the U.S. at least, uh, people think we mean tall buildings. We really are talking about the entire package of things that create sustainable cities, good location, good transit. Um, it does matter, um, you know, our research suggests job density probably doesn't get as much attention as it should. It, perhaps you get bigger performance benefits of concentrating huge hubs and destinations. We clearly need to refine these thresholds. So notwithstanding all the problems I defined of nailing down thresholds, this is what politicians want and expect. So we, we need better analysis on that. Um, 
I'll just sort of lean on the work. I didn't talk a lot about this, but I think one of the criticisms I would also have is a lot of us who have studied this have focused on stations and nodal areas, and I think it's the synergies of corridors that matter, particularly a place like Curitiba where uh, you get a lot of these corridors where if you, they're kind of natural travel sheds. If you create these corridors where a lot of trips are four to six miles in length, that's the sweet spot of public transit. That's where you can accommodate a lot of trips within 15 to 20 minutes. Much longer than that uh, is too many stops. People won't take public transit. Shorter than uh, four or five miles, say, you know, a lot of people will bike or take alternative modes. So a place like Curitiba, I think, has really done transit-oriented corridors, mixing use of these kind of natural travel sheds, um, high-quality time competitive transit. The service quality does matter. And my very last slide, um, <laughs> You know, in too many cases in North America, I would say, the presumption is if you build rail, magic happens around station. There takes a lot of pump priming. We know that from all the experiences. You can't rely on market forces only. This notion of articulating, organizing densities and good quality pedestrian environments, I think some of the examples I cited in Los Angeles and other places, I think, uh, sort of echo the, that sentiment. Um, to me, though, one of the big concerns I have is, sorry, um, the very places where we're expecting much of our urban population growth um, is the global south. Uh, you know, Latin America, South Asia, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so forth. According to UN Habitat, between 2010, 2030, roughly 90% of the urban growth worldwide is going to be in these non-OECD countries. And mostly, they're not going to be in megacities or cities even over a million inhabitants. The majority of the growth is going to be in cities of 100,000 to half a million. They're not going to be cities that can afford heavy rail and probably even light rail. They're going to be building bus rapid transit. Unfortunately, these bus rapid transit investments are not being thought of as city shaping investments. They're really driven by engineering principles, short termism, many times motivated by politicians who simply want to get projects done within their term of office. And we're really, in my judgment, not. Um, exploiting or capitalizing opportunities to treat these as more, as ways to really create much more sustainable urban form. So in my work in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, that's what I've been really trying to convince people as part of the loan package is to make land use planning a very, you know, a requirement in order to get the foreign loans to build the system. Um, and I'll just sort of end on this last point. Uh, you know, service versus density, you know, I think it's still a debate we find in, in the field. I personally think it's a false dichotomy. You need both. Um, you know, you can't have good sustainable density unless you have good quality transit, frequent, on time, um, clean, safe, reliable public transit. And at the same time, you've got to generate enough riders in fare box income to cover the cost of that frequent service. So you need some of the density and mixed use and good urbanism and good quality density. So. Uh, it, it's not a good debate. I think we clearly have to have great transit. We have to have compactness. We have to have all the other components that make for a, a, a good quality city and a good quality public transit system. And again, I think they feed off of each other. Um, so I uh, went a, a bit long here, but I will close with that. And uh, at this point, uh, entertain questions, comments, criticisms, what, whatever you care. So thank you.